My name is Scott Barber. I have an office uh, right next door and another one in Snellville. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and uh, I do a lot of sports medicine, a lot of joint replacement uh, surgery. And um, <clears throat> I've just recently joined uh, the DeKalb um, community uh, about six months ago. And I can tell you from um, working in uh, joint replacement centers all over the country that this uh, um, system that they have in De at DeKalb with the Joint Solution Center is as good as anything I've seen in total joints. They, they really do a, a first-rate job of um, providing you good surgeons that do great operations. The post-operative care on the floors is just absolutely excellent from the pain control to the physical therapy and follow-up, and uh, I, I think they do an excellent job of meeting the needs of joint replacement patients. And uh, I encourage all of my patients to, to have their joints done at DeKalb Hospital. Um, they brought me in today to talk about hip arthroscopy, and many of you may not have heard of hip arthroscopy, but it's a relatively new procedure that we've been working on uh, for maybe about the last 10 years. Uh, and even with all the progress that we've made, there are still very few people, uh, including doctors, who understand much about the pathologies of the hip short of uh, arthritis and joint replacement. And I do a lot of work uh, in the hip that uh, takes care of problems in the hip before you need a joint replacement, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to note that uh, DeKalb Hospital is in the top 10 in the nation overall for uh, orthopedic service in 2010. It's a five-star rated by health grades for total joint replacement, hip fracture, and total knee replacement. And like I say, I've been at uh, many hospitals in uh, different states across this nation, and this is by far the best uh, program that I've seen, and I'm really, really proud to be associated with it. <clears throat> Basically, when people are talking about uh, joint pain, whether it be knee or hip, uh, the things that uh, patients are going to notice are uh, pain in and around the hip. You might have pain in the middle of the thigh. Whether you have arthritis in, the, in your hip or your knee, you might be experiencing the pain in the thigh. Uh, people uh, with knee arthritis will, will, uh, may notice swelling in the knee and certainly loss of motion. And uh, a lot of patients that have uh, hip pathology will notice that one leg might be shorter than another leg uh, and, and something that's different. Most of us have legs that are a little bit uneven, and that's normal, but if you start to detect that one leg seems to be a lot shorter than the other and it's not something you've noticed before, that may uh, be a sign that you're suffering from arthritis of a joint. <coughs> the benefits of hip arthroscopy, there's a much smaller incision, there's much less blood loss. <coughs> it's an outpatient procedure. Um, and you have a lot faster uh, return to work. Uh, and the thing that's important to distinguish with hip arthroscopy from other types of hip replacement surgeries is hip arthroscopy treats a totally different problem than a joint replacement. So the important thing to know about hip arthroscopy is that if you're suffering from hip pain, that you see somebody who's able to differentiate between the different types of problems so that you don't end up getting a joint replacement when a hip arthroscopy would solve your problem, and I can tell you that that does happen a lot because patients have intractable pain in their hip. The, the doctor that they see doesn't have any other option other than to do a joint replacement. But in many cases, um, a hip arthroscopy, if you're the right patient, uh, will solve your problem. Um, after surgery from hip arthroscopy, there's just two little poke holes we close with strips. I don't even use stitches. Um, they're virtually undetectable when you heal. Um, you walk the same day, um, and depending on what your pathology is and how much work I have to do, people are usually back to pretty close to full activities by 12 weeks, and uh, people are back to their daily routine probably in about two weeks on average. So it's a, it's a really good procedure and very effective. Um, no matter what type of surgery you have here at the joint center, whether it be a knee replacement, a hip replacement, or some kind of arthro uh, arthroscopic procedure, you'll be up uh, either that day or the next day, especially with hip replacements and knee replacements. Um, <clears throat> I'm obviously associated with all the other doctors here, and I can tell you that I I'm proud to be associated with the other surgeons here. We all do a great job, uh, and, and um, you get a top-notch, first-rate uh, um, 
type of joint replacement, whether it's hip or knee or shoulder. Um, <clears throat> One of the conversations I always have with my patients in the office is, you know, part of my job is to prevent, or most of my job is to present patients with, with their treatment options. You have a problem, you go to see your doctor, and your doctor basically explains, you know, this is what the problem is, and these are the potential solutions. And the one thing I like to get my patients to understand is that a joint replacement is an excellent procedure. If you have arthritis in a hip or a knee or a shoulder, and it is making your life not as fun to live, you need to really consider getting a joint replacement. They're tried and true uh, operations. Their risks are very small and their outcomes are usually extremely good. And uh, I really try to make an effort to uh, inform my patients. I have a lot of uh, um, information and, and video on my website so that people can really familiarize themselves with the joint replacements. And I, I just want you to leave my office and not be afraid of it. You know, nobody wants to have an operation, but if you're Choice is to continue going through life with a painful joint or having a joint replacement. I think it's a, it's a really good option. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the hip, the causes of hip dysfunction, and we're going to talk about the solutions. Those are my two girls. And uh, <clears throat> so the causes of hip pain um, are, you know, primarily arthritis is what most of us are used to. And arthritis is a generic term. It just means inflammation of a joint. It encompasses more than 100 different uh, diseases. Uh, and we usually don't get into the details that often because they're sort of academic. But the bottom line is when you have arthritis of a joint, eventually the cartilage that covers the end of the bone wears away and leaves exposed bone-on-bone -bone contact. And that ultimately leads to destruction of the joint. And it, I always like to think of it like melted wax. If you can imagine the two bones made out of wax and they just kind of melt and ooze and pretty soon you don't really have, you know, a congruent joint anymore. You have sort of a round peg and a square hole and, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't work anymore. Synovitis is another common cause of joint pain and that's simply inflammation of a joint lining. So you have skin on the outside of your body while on the inside of joints you also have sort of a skin and we call that synovium. And when that's inflamed it's synovitis and a lot of people with hip pain end up having synovitis uh, and that's easily treated with a hip arthroscopy. Labral tear, there's a cartilage inside the hip that commonly is torn. Um, and essentially, if you, we'll, we'll, show, we'll go over it a little more in detail when I get a picture up there of the hip. But essentially, this cartilage can become torn and cause hip pain that mimics um, hip arthritis. And, you know, 10 years ago when people were not doing hip arthroscopy or not doing very advanced hip arthroscopy, Somebody with a labral tear would come into their doctor and, hey, doc, my, my hip is killing me, and I've tried therapy, I've tried injections, and it's just not going away. And a doctor would throw up his hand and say, well, let's, let's replace it. And that was a legitimate thing to do. It worked. I mean, it resolved your pain. But nowadays, you know, we go in and we do an arthroscopy of the hip, and we repair that labrum or debreed that labrum, and you got a painless hip, and you didn't need the hip replacement. So it's really been a tremendous advance. Stress fracture is another common problem. Uh, we'll see that uh, it's often described in military recruits. So you can take young people and put them in kind of a high intensity uh, activity environment like military boot camp and they can develop these uh, stress fractures in the hip. And then older people, especially ladies um, that are small, uh, develop osteoporosis and then they can also get a stress fracture in their hip. So you take an x-ray and you don't necessarily see anything but in fact you have a small little crack in the bone and that's what's causing the pain. Um, another thing you can have is a thing called avascular necrosis and I don't know if any of you remember Bo Jackson, the football player, but that's what he had in his hip. He had avascular necrosis which is a, a very poorly understood condition where essentially the blood supply to a portion of the bone on the femoral head, which is the ball, uh, dies. And when that bone dies, as your body's trying to resorb the dead bone and replace it with new bone, it collapses. And once the head collapses, you don't have a very good shape anymore. And so it ends up leading to an, an arthritic hip and pain. So when people come in with early avascular necrosis, you may take an x-ray and it would be normal. And so it's important to get an MRI so that we can see, we can see uh, early uh, avascular necrosis on an MRI and treat that uh, with, some, with some simple procedures that uh, would eliminate the need for hip replacement down the line. Loose bodies, sometimes you can just get a little bit of cartilage that breaks off and it's kind of like a snowball. Minerals will uh, aggregate on it and pretty soon you got a little marble in your joint and that can cause pain. 
Um, some people have trauma. We see it in car accidents periodically. You jam your hip and it knocks off a piece of cartilage and you got this loose piece in there. So with hip arthroscopy, we can go in and pull that piece out and not disrupt the joint too much and alleviate people's symptoms. And then the newest, oops, the uh, newest um, problem, and this is where my passion right now is, is a thing called femoral acetabular impingement. And this is unbelievable. There's a guy named Mark Philippon. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, Alex Rodriguez. He's a baseball player in the major leagues. He gets paid about a bazillion dollars a year to play. Uh, he's with the New York Yankees now. Well, he recently had his hip treated with a hip arthroscopy by a surgeon named Mark Philippon. I went to school with Mark Philippon, and when he started doing hip arthroscopy 10 years ago, I called him and said he was crazy and wasting his time and, you know, what a loser and all that. And now he's in Vail with the private jet, and he only does eight, Alex Rodriguez and uh, the important people. But the great thing about Mark was he taught a guys like me how to do this hip surgery. And so um, when I first started talking to him, he would tell me about this femoral acetabular impingement, and I told him, you know, I don't see that in my practice. I mean, you know, I just don't see people that come in with this hip pain and, you know, there's nothing really wrong with their hip and you look into it and they, they have this problem until he taught me about it and then all of a sudden I started seeing these people. And I don't know if I was seeing them before and just not recognizing it or they just sort of started showing up to me. But when I start teaching other doctors about femoral acetabular impingement, they'll say the same thing. I never see this problem in my clinic. And next thing you know, they start referring patients to me to have their hip scope. So, uh, this has really been an exciting uh, time in the terms of hip pathology. So now we're going to look at a couple of pictures here. This is uh, an arthritic hip, and um, it's not a badly arthritic hip, but you can see this is the ball, and we've got the leg under distraction, so it's kind of opening the joint up. Normally this ball would be right up in there against the, the socket. And this area right here, just so you see that yellow, that's exposed bone, and this white here is the normal cartilage. So you know, arthritis is a general term that's inflammation of the joint, and essentially when this cartilage wears away, that's the beginning of painful arthritic joint, and we don't want this to happen. We want to protect this white stuff on joints, and you can see this red right here. Normally, synovium is kind of yellowish, and that red is inflamed, angry, mad, painful synovium, and it all has to do with this inflammation of the joint. Um, <clears throat> This is another picture of inflamed synovium, red, angry, up here, red, angry, inflamed synovium, and you can see it up here as well. And with it, this is the labrum, which is that cartilage I was telling you about that goes around the socket, and then this is the socket, and the ball is right here. So you see this inflamed tissue, and there's nothing wrong. This cartilage looks good, that cartilage looks good, this cartilage is a little angry with that redness, but the labrum is otherwise intact. So it's a normal looking joint other than the lining is very much inflamed. And so we can treat that with a debridement. We have a little thing called a shaver. It's like a little lawnmower. You can just kind of go in there and shave that synovial tissue away. And within 24 hours, your body will regenerate a nice new lining that's not inflamed and painful anymore. Now this is, you know, this is the kind of person that's, that goes from doctor to doctor to doctor, young girl, uh, you know, 20 years old, otherwise perfect. You take x-rays, absolutely normal. Get an MRI, normal. Sees one doctor, talk, two doctors, three doctors. Oh, you're fine. There's nothing wrong. You got a little strain in your hip. Don't worry about it. The pain goes on and on and on. They come to my office and they're weeping. Doctor, you got to help me. Please don't send me to physical therapy again. And please don't tell me there's nothing wrong. I know there's something wrong in there. You stick a scope in their hip and boom. That's what you see is a, um, this torn cartilage right here. And this is very easy to treat. We take that little lawnmower I was telling you about and just zip, it's gone. Pull your scope out. You got this pristine, perfect joint with no arthritis. And this patient gets back to their life, no hip pain, and they're very happy. And I'm on to the next one. Now, when I see somebody with this femoral acetabular impingement, and uh, I should have done the slides differently, but we'll get to it in a second where I can show you what femoral acetabular impingement is. But um, I have to make sure that you don't have other problems with your hip. So if, I come, if you come to my office and I take an x-ray and I don't see any sign of arthritis, the next thing I need to do is get an MRI because I want to look out for the AVN. I want to make sure you don't have stress fracture or some other reason for you to have hip pain because this femoral acetabular impingement is a diagnosis of exclusion. If you have a clinical exam, uh, that we'll get into with pain in your hip, 
uh, and you have otherwise normal x-ray, normal MRI, then you have femoral acetabular impingement and the surgical treatment that I do will cure you. So this right here, de oops, this right here demonstrates a stress fracture right there, which is, you know, this would look normal on an x-ray, but you can see it very clearly on the MRI. See on this side, that's a normal hip, and then on this side, you've got that black line with this white, which is edema or swelling of the bone. Uh, on this one, you have avascular necrosis. So again, this would be a patient that has normal appearing x-rays, but you can see that this side looks very different than that side, and that shows the AVN uh, or that avascular necrosis, and we would treat this by simply drilling some holes up into the bone, just and nobody knows why it works, but it seems like it's if you drill holes up into the bone, you relieve the pressure and the blood supplies a lot, gets in there and it, it heals itself and then about 70% of people end up healing perfectly and not having any future problems. And then the loose bodies I was telling you about, you know, you got these little pebbles that get in there. This is the socket. This is the uh, ball, you got it. This is called the cotyloid fossa, which is sort of a normal structure in there, but this also has synovial lining on it. You can see how red and inflamed it is. So this is an easy fix. You pull those things out of there and this person is back and going. Now, the femoral acetabular impingement we were talking about, this is looking at a hip and here's the socket. And if you can imagine, this is a cross section. So this socket would be 3D. It would come all the way around, but you see how far this lip sticks out. This lip sticks out differently on different people. Some people don't have very much of a socket. Some people got a really deep socket. And what happens, this little cartilage here is the labrum. You can see it right there. And so what happens over time is you kind of flex and bring your hip in like this. The front part of the ball, this area, rubs against that. And over time, the bone forms a spur, uh, which is what this little thing is. And the more of this spur you get, the more likely it is to pinch that labrum against the socket and ultimately tear this cartilage. Now the importance of that labrum is, um, is that it, it acts like an O-ring and provides a suction seal. So the ball fits up in that socket and then this labrum goes around the ball like that and it forms a suction seal so that when you walk, there's a suction that holds that ball in the socket. You can imagine if this labrum is torn, the suction seal is lost. And so as you walk, the weight of your leg sort of pulls the ball out of the socket each step. And over time, you know, you end up damaging the joint and eventually leading to arthritis. And that's why that labrum is so very important. So when we talk about femoral acetabular impingement, there's really two types. Um, there's what we call the cam impingement, which is where the ball is a little too prominent. And then there's pincer impingement where your socket is a little too prominent. And, um, what we, and then the labrum is not shown on this, this three-dimensional CT scan, but you can imagine that the soft tissue labrum goes all the way around the socket and forms that suction seal. And as you move your hip and this part bangs that part and pinches the cartilage in between, it eventually can lead to tearing of that cartilage, you loss of the suction seal, and eventually arthritis in the hip causing the need for hip replacement. It's very simple. Over the last 10 years, I've had patients come in and I've done different kinds of physical exam. I've in, I used to inject the hip with anesthetic in the clinic because if I took their pain away, I'd know that the problem was coming from inside the hip. I'd send them all to physical therapy and a couple hundred patients now, not one single person has gotten better with therapy. So I've kind of blown that off and I just go straight to the arthroscopy because every single person that I've done the hip scope on, if they don't have arthritis and I've been able to preserve the labrum, they get better. And every single patient comes in and does that. Oops. Does this. They come in and I'm presuming not every single patient I have talks to one another, but there's something about having that hip pain where they go like that. And this is such a common thing to do that we call that a positive C sign. So if I'm going in to see somebody for hip pain, one of the first things I look for is if they do that. Now people who have arthritis in the hip will also do that. But an arthritic hip tends to cause pain that diffuses down into the thigh and into the buttocks, and it's a little bit different. They don't do that. People with just the femoral acetabular impingement or the labral tear, they don't really have that pain that's radiating into the thigh or their buttocks as much, and they realize it's kind of right in there. So that's something I look for. The next thing I do is I check an x-ray, and if their x-ray is normal, oops, seems like I missed a slide or something in here. Um, I'll check an x-ray, and uh, if the x-ray is normal, I do 
this exam, which is I basically flex your hip, I adduct your hip or bring it into a cross leg position, and I internally rotate, which is basically I'm turning it in like this. And all I'm trying to do is uh, take that labrum and pinch it in between the head and the socket and recreate your pain. And everybody I know that has femoral acetabular impingement hurts right when I do that. They start going, oh, yeah, that's it. Don't do that anymore. And then this is called Faber testing, which is the opposite of flexion, adduction, internal rotation. This is uh, flexion, abduction, external rotation. So it's the opposite motion. And that causes some pain, but usually not as much. And when I do arthroscopy, the problem is always in the front top part of the cartilage and not as much in the bottom back of the cartilage. So this is, the bo this is what pinches the bottom back of the cartilage and the other test pinches the front top part of the cartilage. So I, I can elicit that pain. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of me fixing a labrum. So you can see the torn labrum here. Uh, I'm using a uh, tool right here is a little thing we call a bird beak and I'm basically pushing a piece of suture through the cartilage. I tie a knot here and then you end up with the cartilage repaired with this suture. And then this is after I've taken a burr and I burr down that bump I was showing on the femoral head so that this part of the head does not pinch on that part of the labrum anymore. That's the testing. So then I get an x-ray. Now, 10 years ago, I would look at this x-ray and I say, there's nothing going on here. There's absolutely nothing. This is a normal hip x-ray. I don't see anything. Now I know that people who have this little bump right here, that that's a little bit of a prominence that uh, somebody with femoral acetabular impingement may have this kind of hip. Now, I see lots of hips in people that have absolutely no problem. Looks just like this. And so that's kind of one of the mysteries right now. Why do why do some people with a hip that looks like that get this femoral acetabular impingement and other people don't? Uh, and why does this person only have the problem on their right side but not on their left side when their x-rays are pretty much symmetric? S still questions that are out there. I get an MRI and I'm essentially looking for the labrum being torn and you usually can't see it. Uh, and you might hear, if you know anything about femoral acetabular impingement, there are other surgeons out there who will do what's called an MR arthrogram, where they essentially will inject the, the hip joint with a contrast material and then take an MRI. And the idea being that if you fill up the joint with fluid, it will distend the joint and cause some of the fluid to go through a tear in the labrum, and then you can see it better on the MRI. Well, that's fine, except I've just shown you that people who have intact cartilage um, can have this problem. And so getting an MR arthrogram to me is not helpful because whether or not I see the tear does not determine whether or not this person's going to need a hip arthroscopy. So I, the reason I get the MRI is I want to make sure there's not AVN and that there's no stress fracture or some other reason to cause pain. Because as I said, if you have arthritis, you could have that pain or some other things can cause that same pain. And femoral acetabular impingement is a diagnosis of exclusion, which means I got to make sure it's none of the other things and then what I'm left with is this. So this is me doing the operation. And you can see here it's just one poke hole and another poke hole. And I stick a camera in. And then I can stick tools in and do my thing. I can take the camera and pull it out of that hole and put it in this hole. And helps me do a lot of different things. Uh, and sometimes I'll make a third hole so that I can have one for my camera and then two working portals so I can kind of do two-handed repair. So. I've identified a patient that's got a normal x-ray, they have a normal MRI, but they've got that positive C sign, they've got pain in their hip when I flex, adduct, and internally rotate. I sit down and I have the conversation, look, if I get in there and you don't have any arthritis, you know, I'm going to make you better. If you have arthritis that I didn't pick up on an MRI or I didn't pick up on an x-ray because they're not sensitive enough, I mean, sometimes people have arthritis and it just doesn't show up very well on MRI, then all bets are off. Um, but, you know, that's my job through my experience to evaluate people and I, you know, I try and help them make a decision about whether or not I think arthroscopy will be helpful. And then for people who are in the middle of the road, middle-aged and, uh, you know, a hip arthroscopy might help, I try and present them with the options to let them decide. You want to try the hip scope and if it doesn't work, we do a joint replacement or would you rather just do a joint replacement or how do you want to go? That's kind of what I do. So. 
I love this slide because when I remember when, when I went in to see this patient, when I went in to scope this hip, it was, you know, years ago, and we, I was still learning a lot. I'm still learning a lot, but back then, I mean, every patient was like a monumental, you know, what am I going to find? And I went in there, and I, you know, this was at a point where we were noticing, like, every single patient tears their cartilage in the same spot. It's always in the front top part of the socket. So this is a right hip. My, my, my uh, camera is sort of at the top of the hip, and I'm looking sort of down the front. So this is the right hip ball. This is the right hip socket. This is the labral cartilage. And you see that little area of erythema or redness. That is right where this thing is going to tear. And this person is already exhibiting the symptoms of femoral acetabular impingement. They got the positive C sign. They're having pain. And yet, that's the only thing they have is a little bit of irritation of the labrum. So I go in. I do the, what's called the osteochondroplasty, which is where I take the burr and I shave that little bump off the femoral head and just make it so that it doesn't pinch on the labrum anymore. And this person got better. And then this is just a little bit of tearing of the cartilage. Now, this tear will cause you pain because this little extra piece of tissue will catch in the joint as your hip moves around. That cartilage will pinch in there, and it leads to pain. And this is not going to be picked up on an MRI. You know, this, this thing is only four millimeters across, and that tear is that small. So I take this. This is the lawnmower I was telling you about, a little shaver. This thing has a blade that spins, and I've got suction. So when I put this thing up there, it sucks the tissue into the into the shaver and then it, the blade will will cut the tissue so I can get rid of this and, and then this is kind of the after so you've taken this little thing and gotten rid of it and just that little thing solved patients completely healed no no issues and back to normal so there's that picture I was showing you again of me passing a suture through this labral tear and tying that suture and this is what the bone on the head looks like when I take my burr and take off just a few millimeters so that it doesn't pinch on the cartilage when you bring your head up and in. So if I get into a hip, I might debride, you know, just trim the cartilage. I might have to repair the cartilage, or if you're in really bad shape, I might have to actually reconstruct the cartilage using a graft. And so what this is, is this is tissue from a cadaver, and I'm taking this blood sample and filling it up with the uh, blood from the iliac crest. I, I aspirate blood from your hip, and it's got all those stem cells in there, you know, all those great cells that are able to turn into different kinds of tissue, and I'm just soaking the tissue with it. And then we suture it back in, and over time it heals back in. Your body takes this graft and reincorporates it, and lo and behold, you've got a new a new labrum. So that is, you know, really good stuff. So I've had patients that you get in there and their labrum is just so beat up that you can't repair it. So I shave it and now it's not there. And then they no longer have the suction seal. So when they heal up, they're like, doc, you know, it's better, but you know, it's not right. And the reason we think is that you've lost that suction seal. So every time you walk, you get that little subluxation of the ball in and out of the joint, in and out of the joint, which we think will ultimately lead to arthritis. And you can see that this person otherwise has no arthritis. You know, everything looks good. So this I, I put in there because it's a good picture demonstrating the osteochondroplasty. All this is just yellow bone after I've taken my birth to it. And this is a young girl. She was uh, 15 years old. She was a... Um, I can't remember if she was a gymnast or a competitive cheerleader, but she was, she was ha having, I mean, just pristine. This person was young, healthy, uh, thin as could be, muscular, and just, you know, perfect, and taking narcotic medicine completely debilitated because of this hip pain. I get in there. Her joint was otherwise perfect. No, tear, no tears in the cartilage, no arthritis, nothing, no, no, no uh, synovitis. And so all I did was debreed or perform that osteochondroplasty where I shaved a little bit of the head off so that it wouldn't pinch on the labrum when I let the ball go back in the joint. And she woke up the next day, and she's like, that's it. I mean, it was that dramatic where she's like, yeah, it's gone. And within two weeks, she was you know, not listening to me and just doing everything, and she's totally healed. And this girl's probably two or three years out now, and I check up on her, and she's just tells me my hip is normal. I have no issues with it. So after you do a hip arthroscopy, um, the only therapy I do is stationary bike. 
When your ball or any joint moves, when you move that joint, signals are being sent on a cellular level telling the tissues to behave like a joint. So when we go in there and we inject those uh, stem cells, like on that one case, um, or I debride the hip or I shave the labrum, um, I create raw surfaces in there and bleeding tissue with new stem cells. And so what I want is the ball to move in the joint to send those signals telling all those tissues, hey, you're a joint and you need to behave like a joint and you need to heal like a joint. I do this for 12 weeks and uh, I, I, it's not for exercises. I'm not concerned about getting your heart rate up. I'm not concerned about you doing a lot of resistance and building muscle. All I want is the ball to move in the socket and I've had great results with it. Um, complications of the surgery, I've done a couple of hundred now. The only problem I've had which is not even really a problem, is uh, transient lateral femoral cutaneous nerve numbness. So there's a nerve that goes to your hip that kind of does a uh, feeling of the skin on your thigh right here. I have had my neck fused in the past, and they took some bone from my hip, and I have permanent numbness here, and it's nothing. I'm very happy to have my neck be better to trade it for this. I've only had about maybe 9% of my patients will have that for uh, a week or two, uh, and then it resolves. And then uh, early on in the hip arthroscopy, uh, in order to get into the hip, we have to put your leg in a distractor and um, pull, pull traction on it so we can open up the joint enough to get our little tools in there to, to do our work. And if you put a lot of, in order to put traction on, you're pulling against your perineum or your crotch essentially, and your, your nerves to your private parts are called your pudendal nerve. And we used to use a small post, which we do for fracture work. And when you do hip arthroscopy, it was reported in the literature that people were getting numbness to their privates. And so what we did was we developed an abduction post that's a lot wider than the one we use for fracture work so that it distributes more stress over a wider surface area and puts less pressure on your pretendal nerve. And of the couple of hundred patients I've had, I've had two patients that had one side of numbness for one day. So... Um, there are other things reported in the literature, AVN. You do the surgery and somebody gets AVN, whether that was caused by the surgery or that was just somebody who was getting ready to have AVN and just happened to have the surgery as well, we don't know. Um, and there's other problem called chondrolysis, which is the cartilage just falls off the head after you do the surgery. That's reported in the literature, but I have not had any of those experiences. So I've done a couple of hundred hips. These are the only things I've seen, and this is, you know, this is really scouring to look for complications. I mean, I don't even really consider these much of complications. Um, my patients are extremely pleased. I would say, you know, I haven't looked at the numbers completely, but most people walk out of the operating room the day of surgery and have no pain. I have this special cocktail of medicine I put in the hip joint that's been very good at relieving symptoms. Um, and uh, I had a girl that flew out to see me from across the country. I scoped both her hips. Uh, she flew someplace close the day of surgery. The next day flew all the way across the country, uh, and then the following Monday went to school. So she was young, but uh, it just kind of gives you an idea of um, how debilitating the surgery is. It's not much, and if you're a candidate for it, you're, great, you're, you're in good shape. Um, the results, uh, like I said, I've done a couple of hundred patients. I would say if you don't have arthritis, and I'm able to preserve your labrum. I've been 100% successful at um, getting people 90 to 100%. The vast majority of 100%, there's a handful of people that are, say they're 90% better. And I think most of that has to do with the modification of the technique. There's been a few modifications that we've made over the last several years that have improved our access and just made it so I've been able to do a better job. And so I think some of the people early on I might not have done that osteochondroplasty as completely as I do now. And so they had a little bit of symptoms. And there were a number of kids. You see this very commonly in young kids. They have no problems, x-ray normal, MRI normal. I'd get in that joint and totally normal. I mean, you're looking around, no arthritis, labrum, fine. Ligamentum teres, fine. I'm looking around. I'm like, what is the deal? So I would do that osteochondroplasty. And I would say I probably had maybe eight or nine patients like this, wake them up, rehab them and you know these kids are you know 13 14 15 16 20 and i say you know how you doing they're like i'm the same really and i'm thinking to myself but there was nothing wrong with your hip i cannot believe that didn't solve your problem so every single one of them i took back to the operating room i redid the surgery and i just took more and every single one of those eight or nine people got better
100% better. And that's what convinced me that that trimming of that head is the case. And so the people that I have out the furthest are those kids that are now seven, eight years now, and they're, not one of them is having a problem. Not one of them has any sign of arthritis or anything. And the point I'm trying to make is you catch this femoral acetabular impingement early, it seems to be alleviating problems at least for seven years, so hopefully for a long time. And, you know, maybe this is a reason that a lot of people, when they get older, develop arthritis in a hip. Maybe it's because they had this and we never knew about it. If you do pass the point where the arthroscopy is not going to solve your problem, this is called a Birmingham hip, and this is essentially we just resurface the ball and the socket, and this works great. This is, uh, gets people back to jogging uh, and being very, very active um, and still preserves the bone and everything so that if, if you're you know, 30 years old and you get this in, and it lasts 30 years and you're 60, we, it's easy to just go and do a hip replacement at that point. So this has been a real, real progress uh, in joint replacement surgery because, you know, if you had arthritis and you're 20, the hips we were putting in 10 years ago in a 20-year-old in a would wear out in five years, you know, and you're, you're looking at revising a hip every five years. And, you know, each time you do it, there's more scar tissue, more destruction of the muscle, more loss of bone, and it's just a nightmare, you know, so it used to really be devastating to see somebody in their 20s that had, say, AVN and went on to arthritis, and now we can do this, and, you know, people are doing great, and I put this in, you know, lots of 20-year-olds, and uh, they're all doing great, and then the next thing is the new metal-on-metal -metal heads. This is the ball, fits into a metal head, fits into a metal socket. Um, even five years ago, uh, the metal on metal wasn't even available. We had a piece of plastic in there called polyethylene. And that polyethylene wear created wear particles that would, le would be eaten by white blood cells. And those white spells would, would, could damage the bone and resorb the bone so that you had less to work with. So now we got this metal on metal prosthesis that allows us to have a nice big head so you have great stability, great range of motion, and you don't have these plastic wear particles. So when I see a 50-year-old, you know, it's like, hey, we put this in and you're, you're good to go. And I think you'll probably last the rest of the way with this one hip replacement. Now, you never really know until we get 30 years down the road and can look at all the long-term data and see what else happens. But at least on the surface of it, this seems to have resolved the problem. And those are my two girls. So uh, that's it. Um, does anybody have any questions? No. I, it depends on the patient, and I've done people as old as 70 years old, uh, or in their 70s. I don't remember her age exactly, but, uh, you know, I, I look at the x-ray and I look at the MRI, and if I don't see arthritis, I suggest the, um, the hip arthroscopy, and I just educate the patient, you know, look, if I get in there and you have a lot of arthritis, the scope is not likely to help you. But I have had a number of people in their 60s and 70s um, that have had otherwise perfect joints. They just had a little tearing of the cartilage and it was an easy fix. If you have the arthritis, let's say you're 70, you know, every patient is different. So I, you know, I take in all the information. But if I have a patient and they're 70 years old and they're an average 70 year old, meaning, you know, they're not like that lady that's still barefoot water skiing. I had an 80 year old that's still barefoot water skis. So I treated her a little differently than other 80 year olds. But you know, if you're, if you're an average 70-year-old and you have um, hip pain, I don't see any arthritis on x-ray or MRI, I know a hip replacement is going to completely take your pain away and you'll be able to live the rest of your life with a painless hip and get all your function. If you're 70 and I scope your hip, there's probably a pretty good chance that you've got at least some arthritis. And so if I scope your hip, I may solve a lot of your problem, but not all of it. So it becomes a little bit of, you know, my experience and the patient's own personal preference. Would you rather just have one operation and be done with it? Or do you want to do the smaller operation, take a little bit of a risk that it's not going to solve your problem and need the next operation? Or do you want to just go to the hip replacement? And that's an individual decision. And, you know, we take all the evidence into account. But early on, I was more aggressive about doing the hip scope. And I've been burned enough times that, you know, I'm a lot more careful about it. Just because I've also just seen that, you know, what am I doing here? You know, I know a hip replacement in a 70-year-old is going to give them their life back and take their and work great and last the rest of their life. So what am I really gaining here? So 
you know, that that's becomes an individual choice. Uh, no, they have open MRIs where you can just, if somebody's afraid of going in the tube, yeah, you can just put that, yeah, we have open MRIs to do that. Did somebody tell you you have Petruzio? Yes. That can be taken care of. You know, it's definitely harder to do that, but, I mean, almost any problem you have with your hip can be fixed or improved. Now, there's things that are easier to fix than others, and when you start having Petruzio, it makes it more of a difficult operation, but you can definitely still have a hip replacement even if you have Petruzio or, you know, severe arthritis or other problems. I mean, there's always something that we can do to make it better, you know. But, you know, for me, somebody who's got a little arthritis who's skinny is the best, you know. You start getting bigger people who have lots of arthritis with a lot of deformity and loose bodies and lots of spurs. It technically becomes more of a difficult operation, but you still can, can do it, you know. Well, that's all I have. If anybody um, um, has any other questions, I got some cards out there. It's got my cell phone number on it. Feel free to call me anytime. Um, and uh, also, you may have heard something about this healthcare debate uh, going on in the news. Um, I would encourage you all to uh, contact your elected officials and let them know uh, how you feel about healthcare. Um, I think that the government takeover of healthcare would be a very bad thing for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I can tell you I've been very active in trying to educate our elected officials on this subject. And one of the things I've learned over the last year is that they care what you think. So your phone calls all matter, and uh, I would encourage you all to contact your elected officials and let them know what you think. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good night.